Episode 8 of Behind the Line, I am your host, KC. Follow me on Twitter at KC underscore BTL84. Wanted to give a quick shout out to you guys before we got into everything today. The number for the podcast is increasing big every week, and I'm kind of shocked by it. I've only been doing this for about four weeks now, and I'm pleasantly surprised at how well the numbers are doing. Just know that I appreciate all your support. It doesn't go unnoticed. For only to be doing this four weeks, the numbers that we've been bringing in, I didn't expect to do this early. So I appreciate the support from you guys. We had a great weekend with our NFL bets. After last week's awful showing, I went 0-5 last week. I don't remember the last time I haven't won an NFL game on a Sunday afternoon. We went 5-0 on Sunday. College was 1-2, tough weekend in college. One game under 500 for the year in our college bets. But I'm getting a lot more comfortable with these NFL plays now that we're getting deeper into the season. Starting to get to know these teams a little bit better. I mean, like I said before, September is the toughest month of the year when you're betting football. College, pro, it doesn't matter. Sports books make the majority of their money in September. Never had a losing month in the month of September. So getting a lot better with these with these NFL plays should be above 500. Hopefully after next weekend, we'll make us some money this year. All right, let's get to it. Great weekend all around of football, both college and pro. In my opinion, it was the best weekend of football all year. College football was fantastic on Saturday. Sunday, the NFL as usual, it was great all day long. Just about every game in the NFL yesterday came down to the wire. Many came down to the last possession. Had a few expected blowouts in New England and Dallas. Other than that, I thought it was a great day for the NFL yesterday. I'll get to the good, the bad, and the ugly in just a second. I wanted to quickly mention before we got into everything, Antonio Brown again. Just for a second. And hopefully, I know I said this Saturday, but hopefully this is the last time. I almost included this in the good and the bad and the ugly, but I couldn't really decide whether this was good or ugly, so I just decided to leave it out. I was watching the pregame show on the NFL Network yesterday morning, drinking my coffee, eating my biscuit. By the way, the NFL Network does a, a great job with their pregame show. Rich Eisen, Kurt Warner, Steve Mariucci, Michael Irvin. Very entertaining. I wish they still had Warren Sapp on there, though. I, Warren Sapp just brought a different element to the show. Uh, always funny. Him and Michael Irvin used to go back and forth with each other. I thought the show was a lot better with Warren Sapp on it. His presence is definitely, definitely missed, but... They still do a great job on that pregame show. Anyway, so I'm watching the show, and my phone vibrates with the news from ESPN that Antonio Brown has come out on Twitter and quit the NFL. He went on Twitter yesterday morning and, in my opinion, just made an ass of himself. Not only did he quit the league, which I have absolutely no problem with because I'm tired of fucking hearing about him, but what I do have a problem with was some of the tweets that he's now deleted. That's another thing that pisses me off. If you're going to say something publicly, don't delete it. Stand by what you say. It's not like people don't take screenshots. The stuff is not going to go away. So there's no sense in tweeting something out, deleting it. It just makes you look weak in my opinion. So Antonio Brown calls out Robert Kraft, owner of the New England Patriots. The guy that gave him an opportunity when he did not deserve one. A.B. actually believes in his head that he deserves his guaranteed money from New England and Oakland. He's upset because New England terminated his contract. It's unfair, in his opinion. Now, I do think NFL contracts are unfair towards the players, but not in this case. He absolutely deserved to be fired by Robert Kraft and the New England Patriots. They told him up front, do not do anything to embarrass us. 
It took AB one week to fuck that up. Sent threatening text messages to the woman that's accusing him of sexual assault. I don't know about you, but that sounds like grounds of termination to me. Sounds like you embarrassed the organization to me. He also called out Kraft in his ongoing legal case in Florida and the accusation he received and paid for a sex act in a massage parlor. AB tweeted out, and I quote, Kraft got caught in the parlor. AB speculations, fired, different strokes, different folks, clearly. Basically, he's alluding to the fact that nothing happened to Robert Kraft. No punishment, nothing of that sort. Here's the thing. Robert Kraft is the guy signing the checks. Antonio Brown isn't. Owner, employee, that's how it works. So Robert Kraft can do what the fuck he wants to do. And the law can decide what they want to do with him. When AB buys a team and is signing the checks, then he can do whatever the fuck he wants. There were reports over the weekend that several teams were interested in signing AB. I can't think of any reason why any team at this point would want him, want him in their locker room. Jimmy Johnson on the Fox pregame show yesterday echoed these same sentiments. The guy is the antithesis of the type of player you want on your roster. I definitely don't want him in the Saints locker room. He wouldn't last a fucking week with Sean Payton and Drew Brees. Just like he barely lasted over a week in New England. They don't put up with that bullshit. I said it Saturday. I'm saying it again today. I hope this is the last time we have to hear about Antonio Brown this season. He quit the NFL. He put us out of our misery for the time being. Let's just move on from this guy. One more thing before we get to the good, the bad, and the ugly. I noticed something Sunday as the 1 p.m. games were kicking off. Scott Hansen actually mentioned it on NFL Red Zone. For the first time since 2004, Drew Brees, Big Ben, and Eli Manning weren't starting for their respective teams. It kind of made me realize that we're approaching the end of an era in the NFL that featured the best quarterback play that this league has ever seen. We've been spoiled and have taken for granted how great this group of quarterbacks have been the past 15 years. I mean, think about it for a second. Tom Brady, Drew Brees, Big Ben, Peyton and Eli Manning, Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers, Phillip Rivers, Tony Romo. Hall of Famer after Hall of Famer after Hall of Famer. I don't know in the history of the NFL if you've had this many legendary quarterbacks playing at the same time. Here's the thing. Once all of these guys retire, and it's coming sooner rather than later, who's going to replace them? Besides Patrick Mahomes, what other young quarterback is playing at an elite level? Lamar Jackson might get there eventually. Guys like Cam Newton, Matt Ryan, Matt Stafford will never reach that elite level. Kyler Murray's unproven. Deshaun Watson stays injured because his offensive line can't keep him on his feet. Russell Wilson is great, but I, I wouldn't put him on the same level as Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, and those guys. He's fun to watch. Carson Wentz is overrated. Jared Goff is overrated. The point being, once these guys retire, there will be a vacuum at the quarterback position in the NFL. I'm not convinced that these young guys can replicate what we've been accustomed to seeing the past 15 years. But I hope I'm proven wrong because it's been a, a great 15-year run for the NFL. Okay, let's get to the good, the bad, and the ugly for the best weekend of football we've had all season. Let's start with the good. I said on Friday's podcast when releasing my college football plays of the week that I thought Texas A&M was overrated. And that was a correct assertion. But I have to say, I'm thoroughly impressed with Auburn so far this year. They impressed me in week one beating Oregon. But going into College Station and one of the toughest environments in college football, not only winning, but Auburn dominated that game and kept that crowd silent throughout most of it. That is not a small task. 
Final score was 28 to 20, but this game wasn't nearly as close as the score indicates. This was total domination by Auburn from the first quarter to the end of the game. Defensively, they completely shut A&M down. The score was 21 to 3 going into the fourth quarter. A&M scored 17 points essentially in garbage time when the Auburn defense kind of went into prevent mode. Bo Nix was okay Saturday afternoon, but 12 of 20 for 100 yards, one touchdown. Auburn leaned heavily on the running game, mainly because at this point they have to. I understand they're a running team and that Nix is a true freshman. I get all that. But I'm a bit concerned with the Auburn offense. Nick struggles big time with accuracy. He's the prototypical game manager at this point. He didn't turn the ball over against A&M. And like I said, he is a true freshman. He, and he has grown every game this year. And that's all really Auburn has needed from him so far. But the schedule is about to get significantly more difficult. I think they'll be okay on the road at Florida in two weeks. Felipe Franks is out for the year. Florida isn't explosive enough offensively to really threaten Auburn's defense. However, they've got LSU, Georgia, and Alabama the last four to five weeks of the year. All high-powered offensive teams. They're going to have to get more than 100 yards out of Bo Nix to compete. Or it could get ugly quick. But props to Auburn for a big win on Saturday at A&M. Nice 4-0 start to the year for them. Notre Dame and Georgia put on a show in the marquee game of the week Saturday night. Even in the loss, I was impressed with Notre Dame. This, this team came in as 14-point underdogs. And I was one of many that felt like this was going to be a Georgia blowout. I thought this was going to get ugly and fast. Notre Dame got behind double digits in the fourth quarter, but continued to battle. This game came down to the last possession. The crowd in Athens loud the entire game, led to several offensive penalties on Notre Dame's part. However, they kept their composure and, and almost threatened an upset. Irish were up 10 to seven at halftime. Phenomenal effort defensively to hold Georgia to seven points on offense at home. Ultimately, turnovers were the key to the loss, but if there's ever such thing as a moral victory, this would be one for Notre Dame. I don't think Notre Dame is eliminated from playoff contention with this one loss. If they were on the table the rest of the year, I feel like this team deserves a spot in the playoffs. I feel like I'm the only podcaster or sports show that talks about this issue in college football. But do you see what happens when we have ranked teams play each other? We get great games. This is what I expect every week in college football. We don't get this every week, but I still fucking expect it. This needs to happen more often. I'm tired of these cupcake games. Alabama hasn't played a worthy opponent yet, and we're going into week five of the season. This week they play Ole Miss. Conference game, but another blowout. Until they play LSU in November, I won't be watching Alabama football. There's absolutely no reason to. Every Saturday, the point spread in an Alabama game is 35, 38, 42. It's fucking boring. I want more games like Notre Dame, Georgia, Auburn A&M. But just to give you a quick spoiler alert, I think LSU easily beats Alabama this year. All right, let's move on. There was so much good this weekend, I could literally go on for, for hours. Let's go next to the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills are fucking undefeated. That's a feat in and of itself for this franchise, which has been an eyesore since the early 1990s when they went to those three or four straight Super Bowls and lost. Fans in upstate New York are excited, and with good reason. However... Don't start the Super Bowl parade just yet. I really like this team. I still think they're one year away from a good playoff run, but I really like this Bills team. But I think we need to put the excitement on hold for a minute. First, remember about six or seven years ago, the Bills started the year 6-0. and Ryan Fitzpatrick was the quarterback. Everyone was talking about 
how the Bills were poised for a big playoff run. If I remember correctly, they ended up going 7-9 and nine that year. We we're on a big-time losing streak. They had a soft schedule to open that season. I'm not saying the same thing is going to happen to this year's version of the Buffalo Bills, but let's not get too excited about these three wins. One was against the Jets. The next week they beat Elon Manning and the Giants. And Sunday, they beat the winless Cincinnati Bungles. Hardly a stretch of elite opponents or good quarterbacks. The defense in Buffalo is very good. They force turnovers. They're good against the pass, decent against the run. They get off the field, only allowing opponents to convert 33% of their third downs. And I think Josh Allen is developing nicely this year. But the thing that concerns me with this Bills team is the turnovers. I realize they got a plus one turnover ratio right now, but this offense turns the ball over too much. For the third game in a row, Buffalo nearly gave away a game because of turnovers, mainly by Josh Allen. They have a habit of turning the ball over in the red zone which if you've watched this league for any amount of time, you know that you cannot consistently turn over the ball and win, especially when you're in the fucking red zone. You're giving away points at that point. The average margin of victory in the NFL is somewhere around four points. So points are at a premium. So whenever you're turning the ball over in the red zone, you're giving up three to seven points. Thus far this year, the Bills have been able to overcome these turnovers, but... They've been playing against weaker teams. Once this schedule gets harder, this issue will become exposed. Now this Sunday, they're going to face their first true test of the season when Tom Brady and the Patriots come to Buffalo. So we're about to see if the Bills are the real deal. All right, closing out the the good for the weekend, I wanted to shout out three quarterbacks in the NFL yesterday that had a great day. First, for the second game in a row, Jameis Winston played really well. He decimated the New York Giants secondary. Threw more touchdowns yesterday than he had all season. But what impressed me the most was how poised he was with the game on the line, which is normally where Jameis Winston fucks everything up. Under a minute to go, Tampa Bay trailing by one point. Winston led the offense down the field easily and set up his kicker for an easy potential game-winning field goal. The quarterback he played against was also impressive. Rookie quarterback Daniel Jones did not disappoint in his first NFL game. He made it obvious that Pat Shermer made the right decision in benching Eli Manning. I haven't seen the Giants offense play this well in, in fucking years. This was a completely different football team. Fourth down with the game on the line, The kid has the play breakdown on him, runs six or seven yards for the touchdown. Incredible poise on the road for a rookie quarterback in his first game. Now the Giants defense is still fucking an abomination, but they've got something special in Daniel Jones. They've got something to look forward to for the rest of this season. Last but not least, you knew I couldn't go through this segment without heaping some praise on Teddy Bridgewater. I was highly critical last week of Bridgewater, especially after that god-awful performance in Los Angeles. If you follow me on Twitter, then you also know I was critical of Bridgewater through most of the first half yesterday. I was fucking fed up. The offense looked awful. But he seemed to gain confidence as the game wore on, and he settled in nicely. The Saints defense special team gave him 14 points in the first half. All they needed from Bridgewater was for him to manage the game. And he did a great job doing that. Led them on three scoring drives. The Saints defense was fucking great Sunday. Majority of Seattle's points were scored in garbage time with the game out of reach. But there was one thing yesterday that really bothered me about Bridgewater. And and this might be me being a little bit spoiled from watching Drew Brees for the past 15 years. I could be being a bit too nitpicky here, but I'm going to say this anyway because it really bothered me. 
Bridgewater and the Saints offense was pitiful the first 25 minutes of game time. Numerous penalties, not moving the ball, just all-around sloppy play. On one of the Seahawks' drives, the CBS camera crew showed Teddy Bridgewater. And he's sitting on the sideline, on the bench, by himself, doing absolutely fucking nothing. Anytime Drew Brees is on the sideline, that iPad is in his hand. He's studying the defense. He's going over the last drive. He's looking for holes in the defense, looking for where the offense fucked up, talking to his other offensive players, showing them what's going on. He's basically working on the next drive and the drive after that. After shadowing Breeze for the past two years, I expected the same thing from Teddy Bridgewater. And, and maybe I shouldn't have. That's just a small criticism. Otherwise, I thought Bridgewater was great in Seattle. That's a tough, that's one of the toughest places in the NFL to win. Between that, Arrowhead, and the Superdome, those three places are the toughest places in the NFL to go in on the road and bring out a win. Hell, the Seahawks haven't lost at home in September since 2010. So Sean Payton completely outcoached Pete Carroll yesterday. And that's going to lead off the bad from this weekend. Pete Carroll was completely disastrous Sunday afternoon. That was one of the worst coached games I've seen from Pete Carroll in his NFL career. Seattle had two timeouts when under a minute to go in the first half. Russell Wilson completes a 10 to 15 yard pass. Time keeps going. Then they hit a bomb downfield to around the 20, 25 yard line. And time runs out. First off, if you're, going, if you're not going to use your timeouts, then why not just kneel on the ball and go to halftime? I mean, literally, there was like 25 to 30 seconds left when the Saints kicked the ball off to Seattle. Secondly, if you're going to try to get in field goal range, why in the fuck are you not calling a timeout after you hit the first 10 to 15 yard pass play? I mean, literally, they snapped the ball with maybe eight, nine seconds left threw that long bomb, by the time the guy caught it and was tackled, there was triple zeros on the clock. Now, of course, Seattle tried to claim they called a timeout, but that was complete bullshit. There was no time left. Then in the fourth quarter, Seattle scores a touchdown to cut the lead to 13 points. There's a little bit under four minutes to go in the game at this point. It, really, the game's over with here, but you have a little bit of a chance to get back in it. But instead of going for two and cutting the lead to 11, Pete Carroll decides to kick the extra point. So now, instead of needing a field goal and a touchdown with a two-point conversion to tie the game, you've got to have two fucking touchdowns in under four minutes against the Saints defense that had given you nothing offensively all afternoon. Pete Carroll made another bad decision right before the two-minute warning in the first half. Seattle has the ball, fourth and one, on their own 40-yard line. And Pete Carroll decides to go for it against the best run defense in the NFL. And he runs the ball straight up the middle. This completely changed the game. Actually, this is the play that lost Seattle the game, in my opinion. The Saints offense had done nothing up to that point. Once New Orleans got this stop, the momentum of the game completely shifted. Bridgewater led the Saints on a scoring drive. It built up his confidence. After this drive, the game was pretty much decided because the Saints got on a roll. Seattle went for it several times on fourth down Sunday. They were one of four on their fourth down conversions. God awful. This is the type of stuff I talk about all the time in the NFL. These, these mistakes that can seem not that big of a deal at the time, like the fourth and one in the first half. At the time, a lot of people probably supported him going for that. But plays like that completely change games. In a league where the margin of error is so small, you make a call like that, you give the Saints all the momentum, and they took it and ran with it. Because after that... Seattle was not in that game the second half. They scored most of their points 
in garbage time when the Saints defense had kind of let up a little bit. Really, the Seahawks looked disorganized the entire game on Sunday. Running back Chris Carson seemed to slip and fucking fall every time he touched the ball. Pete Carroll couldn't make right decisions. I know a lot of people are high on the Seattle team, and I had them going to the playoffs in my preseason playoff picks. But right now, I, I just don't see it. I have not been impressed with Seattle through three games this year. In, in my opinion, this is one of the worst Seattle teams in the Pete Carroll, Russell Wilson, Russell Wilson era. Defensively, they aren't as good. Offensive line can't protect Wilson. Russell Wilson spent the majority of that game running for his fucking life. Now, the Saints didn't get a sack because he's just that elusive. But it seemed like every time he dropped back to pass, the Saints defenders were after him. This team has a lot to improve if they want to make the playoffs, especially in the running game. Their running game was non-existent against the Saints. But Pete Carroll has got to coach better if this team wants to make the playoffs. Next up in the bats for the weekend, what a fall for grace for Baker Mayfield. I've talked before about the hype guys, the loud guys in the NFL, the loudest guy in the fucking room, the guys that are always in the media, always talking themselves up, and how often those types of players don't succeed long-term in this league. The successful quarterbacks in the NFL do their talking on the field, not off of the field. Over the offseason, Baker Mayfield was all over the place. I mean, this dude was in a million commercials. He was everywhere. He was everywhere except where he needed to be most, which was working on his game. Over the offseason, Lamar Jackson got better. Patrick Mahomes, believe it or not, he got better. Josh Allen in Buffalo got better. All these young quarterbacks in the NFL coming into their second year improved, except Baker Mayfield, who's gotten worse. Right now, he's one of the worst quarterbacks in the league. With all that offensive talent around him, all we heard all season was how explosive this Browns offense was going to be. Baker Mayfield has found a way to decline. So far, He's completing 57% of his passes, three touchdowns to five interceptions. This Cleveland offense is averaging under 10 points per game. 10 fucking points a game for what was supposed to be one of the better offensive units in the NFL. Like I said, all summer, that's all we fucking heard about about this Browns team was how good they were going to be, how versatile, how dynamic they were going to be. They put up 10 points a game through three weeks. Now, I was skeptical coming into the year. I shared that with you on this podcast. For one, I've never really bought into Baker Mayfield being an NFL caliber quarterback. Secondly, I thought hiring Freddie Kitchens as the head coach was a bad decision by the Cleveland Browns' ownership. I mean, this guy is unproven for one. And I thought they would be better off going with their defensive coordinator last year, Greg Williams. But they let him walk because Freddie Kitchens was Baker Mayfield's guy. Look at the Browns' upcoming schedule. At Baltimore, loss. At San Francisco, loss. Seattle, loss. At New England, loss. This fucking team is going to be like all other Cleveland Browns teams. They're going to be 1-6 going into November. Fucking brutal. You could see this coming from a mile away. This formula never works in the NFL. It seems to me that Baker Mayfield is more interested in his public image, his endorsements, his commercials, attending award shows, than he is in winning. In college, you can get away with pure athletic ability alone. That can win you football games in college. Film study isn't as important. Your offensive schemes at the college level are a lot easier because you don't have as much time for preparation. And also because the defenses just aren't as good. 
But in the NFL, you've got to put in the time. 90 hours, 100 hours a week and prep for these games. You can't skate by on your athletic ability. Michael Vick found that out. But you can't do that and be a successful quarterback in this league. The defenses learn quickly. They were talking on NFL Network over the weekend how much better teams play against Lamar Jackson the second time they play him. Because it's true. They've seen him once. They know him a lot better. The defenses adapt quickly in this league. Remember the Wildcat offense back in 2007 when Miami was running it? No one in the league could stop it. That lasted one year. By 2008, every defense in the NFL had come up with a scheme to stop the Wildcat. I didn't understand the hype around Baker Mayfield last year. Anytime he played a team with a winning record, he lost. He's still yet to beat a good team, and this is his second year. I don't see this getting any better in Cleveland. I really don't. I couldn't believe when the so-called experts were picking them to make the playoffs before the season began. I know we're only three games in, but I'm telling you right now, the Cleveland Browns are not making the fucking playoffs. This is a 6-10 and ten football team, and I'm being generous. All right, let's get to the ugly. You know, I usually reserve this part of the segment for something egregious that happened, or normally it's mainly just for my complaints and for me to bitch about something. Really wasn't much to complain about this weekend, though. But if I were a fan of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I'd be complaining. As I said earlier, second week in a row, the Bucs played a great game. I mean, they really did. Jameis Winston was phenomenal. I mean, he looked as good as I've ever seen him look in his four-year career. All of that negated by a shitty performance by Tampa kicker Matt Gay. When you're a field goal kicker, you've got one job. You're paid good money to do one thing. Make field goals. That's it. Now, obviously... Some are more difficult than others. But when your offense sets you up for a 34-yard field goal to win the game and you fucking miss it, it's absolutely inexcusable at this level. That can never happen. It just can't happen at this level, missing a 34-yard field goal. Not only that, he had a field goal blocked and he missed two extra points. It can't get that much worse for a kicker. For all intents and purposes, Matt Gay lost the game on Sunday for Tampa. Tampa ended up losing that game by one point. You add up his two extra points missed and his two missed field goals, that's eight points. Tampa should have won by a touchdown. They would have covered the spread. I realize that the Bucs had an 18-point lead in the second half. I get that. Defense let Daniel Jones and the Giants come back into the game. But to have your kicker lose the game for you, in my opinion, is just completely unacceptable. Is there really any point for the Miami Dolphins to play another football game this season? This team is unwatchable. There have been a couple of 0-16 teams in NFL history. Detroit Lions back in 08. Cleveland Browns in 2017. Those teams got blown out some throughout the year, but they were also in some close competitive games. They even threatened to win a couple. This Miami Dolphins team, they don't belong on an NFL field at this point. The Miami Dolphins have scored 16 points this season. I'm not talking about 16 points per game. I'm saying 16 fucking points all year. Three games. What is that? An average of about six points a game? 6.6 points a game? Something like that? We're going to have to start blindfolding opposing defenses to make it fair for this Miami offense. I mean, it's that pathetic right now. 
This fucking team averages 222 yards a game on offense. Dead last in nearly every offensive category. At this point, Ryan Leaf would be better suited under center than Ryan Fitzpatrick or Josh Rosen. I've been watching the NFL for 25 years. In 25 years, I've never seen a team as bad as this Miami Dolphins team. You see the Dolphins on your schedule at this point, it's an automatic win. They will be 20-plus point underdogs the rest of this season. And they're, they're 0-3 against the fucking spread right now. They didn't cover yesterday, and Dallas tried to give it to them. Do you understand how rare a 20-plus point dog is in the NFL? It does not happen very often. I realized yesterday that we had two games like that. But right now, the New York Jets are playing with a quarterback that they picked up on the side of the road on their way to New England yesterday. I don't even, what was his name, Nick Falk or something? I don't even know who the fuck that guy was. Sam Darnold's out with Mono. Trevor Simeon got knocked out last week for the fucking year. But the Jets came into the season at least trying to win. You can't say the same about the Miami Dolphins. But 20-point-plus dogs in this league are rare. And when you're catching that many points, I almost always bet the dog. These are professional athletes. They know point spreads. So when they're that big of an underdog, most of the time they come to play and at least, at least try to cover. I mean, we saw that yesterday with the New York Jets. They made a couple of big plays on special teams and they ended up covering against New England. We're not seeing that type of effort in Miami. This roster has completely given up on this season and this coaching staff. I would say we'll keep seeing guys request trades, but Miami's already traded away all their best talent. Minka Fitzpatrick was the last one to go. The rest of these guys are fucking scrubs. I mean, seriously. Who the fuck is going to trade for a Ryan Fitzpatrick? You want Kenyon Drake on your team? A guy that fumbles the ball every fucking time he touches it? Get the fuck out of here. This team is fucking abysmal. They're awful. All right, I'm out of here. Hit the like and subscribe button on YouTube, SoundCloud, even Spotify. Finally got the podcast available on Spotify. Good God. Took three weeks. It was a painful process. But I, I will admit the Spotify customer service team was very helpful throughout. I will say that. But their sign-up process is very... Uh, mind-numbingly difficult. Give me that five-star rating on iTunes. Leave a comment in the section below. Let me know what you think of the show. If there's anything you want me to talk about, anything you want me to discuss, let me know in the comment section or hit me up on Twitter at KC underscore BTL84. I'll be back Friday morning with news and college football bets for the weekend. As always, I'll come Saturday when my NFL plays coming off a 5-0 weekend in the NFL, so going to try to keep that up. Have a great week. See you guys Friday morning.